What's the story, Morning Glory? What's the word, Hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and for joining me for this extremely late review of 90 Day Fiance Season 9, Episode 10. So the new episode, Episode 11, is coming on tonight, and I'm just now doing Episode 10. But here we go. Let's start off with Kobe and Emily. So apparently her parents have agreed to pay for the wedding, of course, because Emily is spoiled. She is a spoiled brat, and whatever she wants, she's going to get. And so Kobe just needs to take some serious notes from her parents and her grandmother and everybody else that knows her on how to deal with Emily because there's just no way that she grew up spoiled and then she's going to end up getting married and expect Kobe to not treat her the way everybody else has been treating her. So Kobe, just a word of warning, when you marry Emily, you're going to have to give her everything that she wants, regardless if it makes any sense, regardless if it's reasonable, you're just going to have to give in and give her exactly what she wants if you want to have a happy life with her. So her parents will contribute about $10,000 for the wedding. Kobe wants to conserve that money as much as possible because he does want to move out of her parents' house. So he wants to use some of that money to be able for them to move out, get their own place, and start their own life together. Emily is like hell to the no. I'm going to use every single penny of that $10,000 towards my wedding because she wants the full wedding experience. She wants the flowers. She wants the catering. She wants the whole shebang. So I don't know what they're going to do about that. So she is taking him to a place called Rock City. And I guess she really hyped up this place because Kobe was expecting something very um, momentous, something really big and extravagant. And when they got there, it was just like an open field with a whole bunch of really big rocks. And so Kobe was like, Oh, so this is it. And yeah, Kobe, this is it. Just like how your marriage is going to be moving on to. So the, she goes wedding dress shopping with her mom, her sister and her grandmother. Um, I must say that um, the dresses that she tried on looked really good on her. I prefer that first dress than the second dress, but both dresses looked really, really good on her. So she starts talking about uh, the wedding ring. She tells her family that she's expecting Kobe to buy her a wedding ring and her sister was like, but you already have a ring. And she said, well, the ring that I got was from some vendor he bought off the street in China. So she wants, you know, the real deal Holyfield, you know, wedding band, a uh, wedding band set. So she ended up buying her own ring just in case Kobe wouldn't buy her a ring. So she showed the ring that she bought for herself and it was a gorgeous ring. And so she said that if the ring he buys her isn't to her liking, no, she said that if he doesn't buy her a ring, that's the ring that she's going to wear. That's the ring that she's going to keep. But, and then somebody asked her, well, if he bought, what if he buys your ring, but it's not up to your standard. And I think she said, well, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And her mom was trying to explain to her, this is not about a ring. You know, you getting married to Kobe is not about a ring. It's about, you know, a lifetime commitment, marriage, the ups and downs of marriage, etc. Emily's like, I know it's not about a ring, but I just really want a nice ring. I know what a marriage is all about, but I also want a really nice ring. And... She has the right to want that. That's okay to really want that. But that is something that you can get it at any time. So if he gave you some flimsy cheap ring from China and you want something, you know, a little bit more substantial, then that's fine, girl. You don't have to have it on that particular day. You can just, you know, y'all can put your money together. He can just, when he starts working, he can start saving his own money. And then he can surprise you with the ring of your dreams. You don't have to have it like right, right, right now this minute. You can eventually get the ring that you want later on in the future. Um, so she claims that she's been hinting at Kobe to buy her a ring and everybody's looking at her like hinting. You're more, it's more like you're browbeating him. Like you're mentioning it every other second that you need him to buy your ring. And I have a feeling y'all that she's going to expect him to spend his $4,000 on, on the ring, the 4,000 that he brought to America with him. So the sister feels really sorry for Kobe. And I think the mother does too. But I guess in this family, you just don't stand up against Emily. <laughs> you just don't say anything that she's not going to like. And you just kind of like listen to what she has to say. And you keep it moving. Watching this scene with Emily, it was kind of like she's treating this whole wedding like it's some type of a production and she's the star. And um, it seems like she's more 
in, she's more into the production of the wedding and her being the focus of attention. And this is going to be her day or her night more so than she is about what this wedding symbolizes, which means, you know, the joining of two lives and starting off together as one. And she doesn't really care about that. She just wants to look good from head to toe. And I don't think it really matters to to Emily, like who's standing next to her, who her leading man is, as long as she is the star of the show. That's all she really cares about, how it's going to look, how it's going to be presented, what it really means behind the scenes and all of that. I don't think she really cares. But that is my review of Kobe and Emily. Good luck, Kobe. Moving on to Jabri and Miona. So Jabri is under a lot of a lot, a lot of stress. Uh, This whole Miona thing is really stressing the hell out of Jabri. And it's so bad that his parents are like, let's go meet for coffee and talk because you're going through some stuff and we need to talk about it. So he meets up with his parents and it's just him without Miona. He meets up with his parents at a coffee shop and the parents tell him that uh, they've noticed some changes in him. He doesn't seem like his normal self. Um, He does admit that he's under a lot of stress. And then they start talking about the wedding. So the parents tell him that they're not going to be attending the wedding because they just don't support any of this. They don't really care for Miona. They think that they're rushing this uh, whole marriage situation and they're not going to be there. And since it's a beach wedding, it's probably going to be in another state. And so maybe there's also issues with timing and well, for sure, no one else in the family is going to be able to attend because it seems like a short notice or something. So yeah, this is just the whole beach wedding thing on a 90 if you're going to be having a 90 day wedding if you if you have to have a wedding in 90 days and you're doing a destination wedding it's just it's it's going to get real hectic and i don't think a lot of people are going to be able just to stop drop and roll and go and attend your beach wedding so Jabri said that he would not be getting married if he didn't have to, but it's all, it's just the pressure of the whole 90 day thing. Um, the mom believes that he's getting married in fear of Miona's reaction. If he were to tell her that he didn't want to get married right now and the parents just want him to be happy. So he needs to have a conversation. Oh, and he did say that he would not be, get, oh yeah, did I say that he wouldn't be getting married if it wasn't for the whole 90 day thing. Um, he himself would not be getting married. Um, he would prefer to wait. So he decides to have a conversation with Miona. So he takes her to the park and he basically tells her that he had a conversation with his parents and they noticed that he's not happy. And Miona also mentioned to him as well that, you know, well, I'm not happy either because of the way that your mom has been treating me. It hasn't been a walk in the park for me either. And so Jabri was like, how has she been treating you? And Miona's like, you know, the comments that she makes about my clothes, about my cooking. And Jabri was trying to tell her that he would prefer that him, that Miona and his mother get along. That would be the ideal situation for him. And she was like, oh, well, that's not going to happen. Um, she doesn't like me. I don't like her. We're not going to get along. We don't see eye to eye. And that's just how it is. And you're just going to have to deal. And Jabri was like, no, I don't have to deal with that because I really want my parents at my wedding. And she was like, uh, and then he tells her they're not, they're not even going to come to my wedding. And Miona's like, okay, that's fine. That's, that's okay with me. <laughs> like, what's the problem here? And Jabri is like, well, it's not okay with me. I need my parents at my wedding. I want my parents at my wedding. So Miona just sees Jabri as like he's being influenced by his parents. He's doing what his parents want him to do. And she's, you know, she really like says some really mean things about him. She says that he's just a kid. He's acting like a kid, that he's not a real man because he's listening to his mommy and his daddy. And it just left a really bad taste in my mouth the way that she was talking about this man that she supposedly loves. Like, don't you see the pressure he's under? She's noticed that he is, he has been acting different. She notices that he is kind of distant from her, but like, don't take the time to find out like what's really going on with him instead of just dismissing it as, Oh, you're a mama's boy and you need to be more of a man. There's a lot going on. You know, he has issues with his career. It's not taking off. It's not popping. Um, there's issues with the album that he's trying to do with his band. He's getting pressure from his parents. He's getting pressure from Miona. He's getting pressure from the government to do this whole 90 day wedding. And so he suggests to Miona, well, what if we just kind of hold off on the wedding and just, you know, um, just continue to date each other. That's going to give us time to save up more money. And then when you come back again, you know, you can have the wedding of your dreams. He's really trying to sell it to her. And she's like, hell no, I'm not doing that. She says, if I go back to Serbia, we're done. We're through. We're not going to be together anymore. I'm not going to postpone the wedding 
either we get married right now when I want, how I want, or I'm out of here. And that's your only option. So uh, good luck, Jabri. Moving on to Thais and Patrick. <sighs> okay, so Thais and Patrick. Thais has not been happy lately because, you know, she has to live with John and also because of um, she feels sort of left out of the relationship you know, in general, because Patrick has made all of these arrangements with the house. And I guess the wedding, I don't know what she was talking about. But because he's so like, he's, he doesn't really involve her too much, she feels really left out. And so she hasn't really been happy. So to cheer her up, he decides to take her shopping so she can buy stuff to decorate the new home, which that in itself is like the gag of it all. So they go to a furniture store and um, he's really like in a bad mood. He's really grumpy. Uh, she's happy to be there because she's excited about buying stuff for the home. So she's looking at the couches. He's like, no, she's looking at some paintings. He's like, no. And so she's like, okay, so what are we doing here if we're not going to buy anything? And so the, the sales guy, I guess he felt like, you know, he wasn't going to let these people walk out without buying something. So they look, it looked like they had shut down the whole store just for this scene to take place. And so the sales guy was probably like, oh, hell no, y'all aren't going to shut down my damn store and not buy anything. <laughs> so he tries to encourage them to try to buy something. You know, there could be, there's something in this store that both of you can compromise on. So she sees a pillow. She sees a damn pillow, a fluffy pillow, and she really liked it. And he was okay with it too, because it was his color, a color that he liked. He doesn't like anything too flashy, too bright, too bold. He likes black, gray, and white. That's it. So the pillow was like a bluish gray. So she's like, oh, I like this pillow. And the guy says $160. And Patrick is like, no. So she's like, why did you even bring me here if you're not going to buy anything? And um, he has a lot of financial anxiety. He's like, this stuff isn't important to me. I don't really care about home decoration. Uh, I still have to pay for a wedding and I'm taking care of you and I got to do this and I got to do that. So I don't really care about home decoration. It's just a waste of money, you know, just to buy stuff that you're not even going to use. You're just going to put up on the wall. And, and I'm just like, oh my God, Patrick, what happened to you? What's wrong? Did you wake up on the wrong side of the bed? If you don't want to buy anything, no one forced you to take her there. You, had, you could have just had another argument and stayed home and argued about something else. So um, he says he's not really big on home decor. Okay, if you're not really big on home decor, then what does it matter what she buys? What if she bought a red pillow? Like what would be, so if you don't care about home decor, let her buy something that's going to represent her, that she, that's going to be, you know, to like something that she can contribute, like something that's about her, that she would like in the home. If you don't care about home decor, let her get a, a anyways, it didn't make any sense to me. He takes her there. He doesn't want to buy anything. He says, I don't care about home decor, but everything she touches, he didn't like, you know, he didn't want her to buy it. So they finally compromise and um, he buys her a vase, like a a, a blue, like a, a base, a, a, de a decorative vase. And that's the only thing that they walk out with. So when they get home, um, they, she puts the vase in the on the middle of the kitchen table. And then he says, well, are you going to put something else around it to make it look better? Like what? You didn't want to buy anything. Like, what are you talking about, Patrick? So... She was lucky that she walked out with a vase and then he's going to be like, well, aren't you going to put something around it to make it look better? OK, whatever, Patrick. So he's being really mean to her. Um, they're talking about finances and she's saying how I don't know how much money you make. So I don't know what you can or cannot afford because you don't tell me about your finances. He's like a son of your business. You're not even my wife for me to even talk about my finances. And then um, he was just being really ugly to her. And then he takes out his uh, credit card and some cash and he throws it across the table. He's like, here, if you want to go buy a painting, go buy a painting. If that's what's really important to you here. Here's my card. Here's some cash go buy a painting and I'm just like Patrick what is the deal so whatever and he talks about you know growing up it was about survival you know when you bought something you bought food to survive you didn't buy a whole bunch of unnecessary stuff so Patrick you can't take that baggage and put it on her she was not responsible for that <clears throat> and if you're still feeling some type of way because of your childhood and how you were brought up and what you were lacking go get therapy go get therapy and work through these things because it's not fair to your partner otherwise don't date anybody just you and John be miserable thinking about the past wallowing in 
in the past, crying and being depressed about the past, about how y'all grew up, how y'all were mistreated. Just stay like that then. But if you want to move forward with your life and you want to have a partner, you need to fix it. You need to deal with these emotions, these feelings, these memories, these thoughts. You need to deal with it so that you can be like a whole man for your partner. So they have a conversation and, um, you know, they talk about how she, you know, she says, you know, you need to include me more in your decision making and you need to communicate with me more so I can know what the hell is going on. And um, I think he did finally agree to that. Uh, So he says that he is going to try moving on to Bilal and Shahida. So he takes her to Atlanta uh, because his sister lives in Atlanta, Nefertiri. She lives in Atlanta. And so they're going to go visit her. They're going to stay with her. And Nefertiri is also going to be helping Shahida do some wedding dress shopping. So they go to the wedding dress store and she tries on a couple of things. And then um, she tells the sister, the issues that she's having with Bilal. And I have a feeling that the sister really would prefer not to have gotten involved, but the sister obviously was going to side more with her brother um, because she's very protective of her brother after all that he's been through with his previous divorce. So I kind of felt like she... Shaida didn't get the best advice from the sister. Uh, the sister, I mean, Shaida also talked about the children situation. She was like, you know, I really want to have kids. I've always told him that I want to have kids. And he's just kind of like always flipping back and forth. And he doesn't really give me a straight answer. And she says that having children is a deal breaker for her if he doesn't want to do that. And so the sister says, well, um, I'm pretty sure he wants children, but I don't, you know, eventually he does. I don't think he wants them like right now, right now, but at some point he is going to want to have more children. But Nefertiri, my dear, Shahida is 37 years old. So of course you can always have, you know, people have children late into their forties and maybe even early fifties, but that's really pushing it. If she's 37 years old and she wants to have, you know, children and she wants to have possibly more than one. You don't know if there's fertility issues. You don't know if there's, you don't know. So there might be a lot of time spent just trying to figure out if you can even have a baby. And then you have to go through the process of trying to have a baby if you can't have it the natural way. So she doesn't have that much time. So he needs to like make a decision today. So after that, Bilal has planned like a really romantic day for her. Uh, The first thing that they do is they go on a Ferris wheel. So it's like those really big, gigantic Ferris wheels. And so they're on the Ferris wheel and they're taking it all in. And it seems like she's having a good time. And stupid Bilal decides that this is the perfect moment to talk about a prenuptial agreement. Are you kidding me? Y'all are supposed to be on a romantic date in Atlanta, kind of like a mini vacation. And this is when you decide to bring up the prenuptial agreement. That could not wait until y'all got home. Like for real, Bilal all your timing is garbage so he says that the his lawyer sent him um like uh he his lawyer sent him the prenuptial agreement and um so this is what it's going to be and she's kind of like oh okay I thought that you were we weren't going to do that because she mentions that he had mentioned a prenup before she said that she wasn't in agreement with it and it was never talked about again so she just assumed that they weren't going to do it well lo and behold on the ferris wheel on this so-called very romantic day he decides to shove this prenup in her face and be like okay this is what my lawyer sent me And she's not cool with it at all. And so he tries to sell it to her. He's like, you know, we're protecting me. We're protecting you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, how is this protecting her when she had no say so in it? She wasn't there when it was drafted. She didn't talk about the things that she felt like were in her best interest that needed to be protected. This is something that you and your lawyer discussed. So Bilal, stop. So after that, they get off the Ferris wheel and then they go on a carriage ride, a horse and carriage ride. Her whole mood has changed, obviously, because you want to talk business. You want to talk about negative business on this so-called romantic date. And so uh, she asks him, well, can I see the agreement again? So he shows it to her and she's looking at it and she says, you know what? It doesn't mention anything about children. Like how would our children be protected in this? And he was like, he gave her some vague answer. He was like, well, well, you know, it says here that I'm the husband. I'm going to be providing for my family. Okay. Yes. That's what you would do as the husband. The prenuptial agreement is if you are no longer the husband, if y'all would get a divorce, like who would take what? So 
when you're no longer the husband, the prenuptial agreement protects you, Bilal, not what you're supposed to do as a husband and a provider for your family. So it was a whole bunch of vague mumbo jumbo from him. And um, Shahida is not feeling it. She's like, you know, what this means is that uh, this is it means that you don't trust me. That's what it means. This is what I, I, this is the feeling that I get. You don't trust me. So you feel the need to have a prenuptial agreement because of what happened in your past. You know, Shahid is being punished because he probably went through some, the, the ex-wife probably took him to the cleaners and he was probably like never again. So Shahid has to suffer the consequences of his past actions. So she says that she doesn't want a prenup. She trusts him 100%. Bilal says um, in his confessional that a prenup protects both of them, which it does and only protects you. So stop BSing us. And I don't know what they're going to do. Um, I think that she should choose a lawyer. He should pay for her lawyer because she can't. She, she probably couldn't. She should choose a lawyer of her choice. He pays for her lawyer and her lawyer needs to also go over the prenup and her lawyer needs to make sure that her best interest is, um, her best interests are covered as well. That's what she should do because it seems like Bilal is not going to back down on the prenup. And if she still wants to marry him, because she may not, if she still wants to go through with the marriage, then she needs to get the lawyer of her choice that he's going to pay for. And then her lawyer needs to make sure that the prenup covers her interest as well. Moving on to Benny and Ari. So this is Benny's first competition. Um, his first MMA competition is coming up. And, um, I'm not even going to talk about what they talked about with him training with a female because she's still going to stay with Benny. They're not going to break up over that. So what's the point of you talking about it? But anyways, so he, it's the night of the fight. He's really, really nervous. And no, she, he's not nervous. She's really, really nervous. And so she is, you know, he seems to be really cool, calm and collected. He's ready to fight. This is because his dream has come true. This is what he's wanted to do for so long. And now, you know, his dream has come into fruition. So Benny himself, he's excited. Um, he's like super calm about the fight. He's not worried at all. So Ari is the one that's worried. And Ari says that her father, you know, her father's a doctor. Her father wouldn't even, uh, attend the fight at all as a spectator because he's a doctor and he knows what type what kind of injuries these types of fights can cause so the doc the the father want to know parts of it her mother will be in attendance as we see that later but anyways and so she tries to convince him to not go through with this now i'm like ari you're being a really trashy partner right now how are you going to tell this man to not go through with his dream when he is supposed to be doing his very first fight that night. I mean, he has to be in a certain type of mental space for his competition. And here you are talking about how he could get hurt. He could possibly die. Uh, how about you not do this? Uh, I'm really worried about you. Like Ari, no, you need to put your own personal feelings aside and be there to support him for this one night. All these issues that you have, you should have brought this on a long time ago. Okay, when he was still training or before he even began training, that's when you should have brought up all your issues about, oh my God, you're going to die. That's when it should have been talked about. Not the night of the fight, girl. That was just horrible for you to do that. Because can you imagine like if you were to take a really big, big test that was going to make or break your career and the morning of your test, your partner's like, well, what if you fail? What if you get all the questions wrong? You know, what if you like, you don't want to hear that. You want to hear something encouraging, something motivating, something that's going to help you get through this. But she's, she's garbage for that. So when they get to the venue, um, Benny is like so excited. He's so pumped. And when the fight starts, um, he came out flying like Batman. Oh my God. Benny was not there to play. He was not there to play. He was all about business. When he came out with that kick to the, to the head, I was like, wow, who <laughs> Lord have mercy. Wow. Benny, he did that. He really did that. So the whole fight lasted 33 seconds. Benny ended up winning, uh, with a chokehold and, in 33 seconds, it was over. <laughs> and the whole entire time they were fighting, uh, Ari could barely look. She was so nervous. And, you know, it's it's difficult to watch, you know, your man getting possibly, you know, getting fighting. He's fighting up there. And it's difficult to watch and it's understandable. So next time, Ari, stay home with the baby. Um, the mother was there. Uh, she was, she actually got up 
and clapped and cheered when he ended up winning the fight. The mother was so happy. Um, and I was happy too, because it's nice to see someone work so hard towards something and then they finally accomplish their goal. That's like a very satisfying feeling. So he won his first fight and in 33 seconds, everybody was happy for him. And he's like, yeah, uh, no, uh, what's her name? Ari was like, yeah, I'm not going to be attending any more fights. This is it for me. Yeah, stay home. Moving on to Kara and Guillermo. So Kara's meeting with her friend Tim. I love Tim. I love Tim. Tim was asking all the right questions. Okay. He was asking all the right questions. I love the questions he was asking. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Kara. So they're talking and, um, Tim don't see it for Kara and Guillermo. Um, he knows how, how Kara gets down. Uh, she's, he does. I, I, I got the feeling that he doesn't really see her being Susie homemaker, settling down, getting married, you know, baking cookies for the children. He doesn't really see that for Kara. That's, that's the impression that I got. So he was like, um, like, you know, are you really sure about this? And she's like, yes, I'm sure. And then, you know, he's trying to let her know, like, how I, I really wasn't paying that much attention. But I got the feeling that Tim was like, not really understanding what this was really all about. Because he knows how Kara is, you know, she's been all over the world. She's got a 1000 different jobs. You know, she's doing this, and she stops and she's doing that. And she's into something else. So marriage, you know, being as like, this first like this thing that is set in stone um I guess he was just really concerned about if this is what she really wanted to do so they talk about Guillermo working and she tells him that she talked to the lawyer and the lawyer said that Guillermo would not be able to work 69 months uh, from when they get married and so he's like well why don't y'all get married a little bit earlier than the 90 than the 90th day or whatever they're planning on getting married and so Kara tells him that Guillermo wants to have like a very extravagant wedding he wants to have his family there he wants to have a venue he wants to do the whole thing and so Tim was like um well I didn't know that this that that y'all were going to be doing that I thought it was just going to be like a quick ceremony and then moving on and then uh, Kara tells him that she wished that Guillermo was a little bit more dominant, a little bit more aggressive in the relationship. And Tim says to the producers, he's like, she don't mean that. <laughs> she really doesn't mean that. Uh, she's just saying that because it sounds nice, but she doesn't mean that. If Guillermo were to stand up to Kara, Kara would knock him back down again. There's no way in hell that Kara wants a very dominant, aggressive partner. That's just not her. So Tim has some serious doubts about this relationship, and he predicts that it won't even last five years. Wow. <laughs> okay. But I did. I like I liked him a lot. Anyways, that is my review. Thank you so much for joining me. If you made it this far, really do appreciate it. Um, on your way out, don't forget to hit the video. If you like this content, subscribe. If you don't, don't worry about it. The new episode comes out tonight. So hopefully I can get that uh, before next Sunday. Be done with that one. Um, anyways, thank you so much for watching and I'll talk to you later. Bye.